Welcome to Gothic Homemaking Presents, a series of short featurettes intended to entertain and inform you in between full episodes of Gothic Homemaking. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Of late, I have noticed a lot of my Gothic YouTuber friends posting messages on social media that were of a particularly sad nature and I probably am guilty of the same thing. Now, I personally have dealt with depression all of my life, and I come from a family with a very rich history of suicide. So I thought, it being this time of year, it might be a good idea to have an honest and frank discussion about depression and suicide with some of my best friends. I am very, very lucky today to be joined by two of the Gothic community's most popular YouTubers, from Leipzig, Germany, the inimitable Black Friday. Hi Voltaire, thank you for having me. It's always an honor. And from Australia, alternative model and one of the kindest souls I've ever had an opportunity to work with, Riri Phillips. Thank you for having me, Aurelio. Um, it's always a pleasure and thank you for the kind words. First of all, let me say I really admire the two of you so much. You are truly beacons for the Gothic community. As YouTubers, you really put yourself out there. And being Gothic, I think, you know, Gothic has a tendency to attract a lot of negative attention. When somebody is Gothic, they are often at the receiving end of a lot of negativity. And that could contribute to feelings of being depressed. Now, I'd like to start by asking a question a lot of uh, the normal people out there might be wondering about Goths. And that is, does being Gothic make one depressed? Or did we become Gothic because we were already depressed? Which came first, the raven or the egg? I think it makes one have to toughen up a bit and learn to cope with negative attention. I guess it depends on the individual. Uh, I can't imagine anyone becoming sad after becoming a goth because like, it, it normally, uh, people normally find it as a kind of relief, like they can be themselves, it, it cheers them up. I do think that goth does bring about a, a bunch of negative attention, but I do think that it is exacerbated by the fact that, you know, society bullies a lot of people who are just a little bit different. It's interesting that you would bring up bullying. I honestly wonder if I would have ever developed this love that I have for the macabre and death and darkness and, and gothic culture. Uh, if I hadn't been so severely bullied as a child, I was I was severely bullied at school, and and I think it really it really kind of opened up my eyes to the the inherent darkness in the human condition. Uh, so school was hell, and, it, and things weren't much better at home. Um, speaking of home, do you think that being gothic makes it difficult to have um, happy and healthy family relationships? I have read some absolute horror stories about the way that people's families treat them um, just for simply liking a different you know taste in music and fashion and all that stuff which seems very very silly when you really break it all down to the nitty-gritty yeah I, I agree with you I think that's very silly and it's very sad to you know not treat a loved one with love because you don't care for what kind of music or, or what kind of uh, clothing they like um, Friday, you recently made a video where you're really talking about your personal life and you're really putting your, some of the struggles that you've been going through recently out there in the world. And, uh, you know, a lot of people wouldn't do that because they might feel that uh, it would leave them vulnerable. Uh, what is your philosophy about sharing intimate details of your life with, with your listeners, with your viewers? As an online personality or a public figure, you're expected to be entertaining and cheerful at all times, uh, but that doesn't give an accurate view of what life is actually like. Um, if people, especially young people, have false expectations about life always being rosy, then they could be doubly as upset when something terrible happens to them. Uh, and as my channel is about me and loosely follows my life, like if something negative but pivotal happens, I'm not going to cut that out and pretend that everything is always perfect because it just isn't. Um, and recently I just had so much weighing on my mind that I was too distracted and upset to appear genuinely happy or focused in my videos. And it was better to be honest and open than to continue the bad acting. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can relate to that. I, I think I'm a pretty bad actor on social media. I really wear my heart on my sleeve. But uh, it really does make you very vulnerable though, doesn't it? 
But I just think it's right to show that life has downs as well as ups. Riri, you're extremely open about your life and your struggles with your viewers. What is it that encourages you to be so honest? What is your philosophy about sharing those kinds of things? My philosophy originally when I kind of started to gain a following on f social media was to hide myself as much as possible. But after, after a while of that, you grow tired of the fact that it seems like a sugar-coated life and that's just not not how life is at all no it sure isn't uh and you are really tremendously honest i i have seen you post about your struggles with anxiety i have seen you post about your struggles with autism uh you know i think lesser people wouldn't talk about those things publicly because they might feel it makes them look weak or even defective in in the eyes of some people and I think you are so extraordinarily brave to talk about those things publicly. What what encourages you to, to be so brave and to open up like that? The main encouragement is the fact that um, I know other people go through similar things or um, similar headspaces, and I don't want people to feel like that. As I said at the top of the video, I, I feel like I've been seeing a lot of the gothic YouTube community posting particularly sad messages around this time of year. Uh, I think the three of us are probably guilty as charged of that. Uh, without revealing too much, if you don't want to, would you say you're depressed? Would you say you're going through a particularly hard time at the moment, Friday? It's weird to talk about it so openly because I mostly just kept it to myself for months. But I never had depression, uh, regardless of how dark times had been in the past. But in the last few months, like proper depression manifested itself. Um, and it's different from sadness because it's largely irrational and just nothing shakes it off. Uh, it's just this heavy, crushing, shadowy, inescapable something that just stopped me from doing anything and stopped me from thinking clearly. It's like a very long, grey, foggy day and continued waiting for the fog to lift so you can carry on with life. Well, as your friend, I'm really, really sorry to hear that you're going through a hard time and you know that I'm here for you if you need anything at all. Depression is certainly no fun whatsoever, that's for sure. And, and you're right that it, it seems very illogical and when it's happening it doesn't really seem like there's very much that you can do to, uh, to make it go away. Um, Riri, how about you? Would I say I'm depressed? Um, I would say very much so in the way that I have spent way too long um, not necessarily running away from my problems, um, particularly with uh, my past and interpersonal relationships with, you know, the people in my life, um, but <sighs> I've hidden in the way that I will continue to, you know, put on a brave face, smile, and try to be what they want me to be. And it hasn't worked. And it's ruined a lot of relationships in my life because I find myself growing tired of trying to please other people. I think I know what you mean by that. Um, when I was 16 years old, my girlfriend killed herself. And she was the classic case of somebody who was always concerned with making everyone around her happy. So of course she was miserable, you know, but she, she wanted the school to be happy and she wanted her friends to be happy and she wanted her family to be happy and she never ever took time for her own feelings and, and ultimately it became fatal. Um, I don't think my family has ever respected me. I don't think that they, they respect me still. Uh, you know, they say they love me, some of the members of my family, and I think that they really believe it, but it's very different from respect. It's very different from accepting someone the way that they are. I, they, they still think that this is an act, like I've been I don't know, living for half a century pretending to be someone that I'm not, and I think that one day I'm gonna, they, they think I'm gonna snap out of it uh, and, and go back to being who I was when I was a child. Uh, and that would be a horror show, <laughs> let me tell you. That would not be something I'd wanna do. 
Um, going back home for the holidays is something I used to do, but walking through the door into that house always transported me back in time and, and, and I reverted back to the, the child that was beaten, the child that was molested, and the child that was severely bullied. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible place for me and so I, I've stopped going. That's really a shame. I guess you can't control what anyone thinks, even your own family, but like I get it. Um, I know some of my family is still waiting for me to grow out of it too. I guess actually my father, my biological father, I have spent way too much time trying to seek his approval over the years and I, I love him so dearly. I, I, I do say I hate him, but I think it's, you know, without hatred you can't have love kind of thing um you know i i I've, I all i ever wanted as a kid and a teenager was the approval of my father and he would always kind of scoff at the way i dress and you know that kind of stuff i have definitely spent way too much time uh you know going home and waiting for the day when they were finally going to accept that this is who i really am uh, but yeah, I finally gave up. I just, I think it's very, I think it's very sad to invest so much time in trying to make people happy who uh, just are never going to accept you for who you are. It's not a way to live. It really isn't. Well, uh, despite having some family members that may not particularly uh, care for your personal aesthetics, do you enjoy spending the holidays with your family? Oh yeah, I used to. I mean, it becomes a little poignant as family members start to die and you remember how nice it was when they were around. Uh, but this time around, I have no family to spend the Christmas season with and that makes me a bit upset. Um, I've been despairing spending the days alone because in Germany, Christmas is three days, not just one. So it's more time to distract myself from the loneliness. But yeah, um, I was lucky as a child. I enjoyed the holidays. Ah, you're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> How about you, Riri? Is it a happy family fun time for you around the holidays? I don't hate the holidays, but I don't like them either. It's more so, the only reason I celebrate Christmas is because of my, my daughter. Um, and to keep my mother happy. I know I said earlier that um, I don't want to do things to make other people happy, but um, you know, there's there's some things that happened many many years ago with my mother i did watch her try to kill herself um and christmas just seems to be the only time of year where she is um incredibly happy so i think we within my family anyway we all go the extra mile to make sure that it's you know happy for her at least and i guess we all forget about ourselves in that way but just as long as my mom's happy whatever well I, I guess we I guess we share that I um, I watched my mother try to kill herself I think probably several times a year my entire childhood and I I, I found her in some very very gruesome uh, conditions um, having overdosed on antidepressants and you know eyes rolling up into the head and foaming at the mouth and choking on her own tongue and and, uh, you know, I think when you're a child, there's a natural inclination to want to save your parent if your parent is dying. But after, you know, years and years of this, and there's a psychological part of it, too, that kind of wears on you. You know, like you start to wonder when you're a small child and you don't really understand depression, you start to wonder, like, wow, do they not love me enough to want to stay here with me? Uh, but eventually, you know, it just got to be too hard and I eventually just gave up on that that whole situation. I eventually started rooting for her. You know, I was like, I thought, well, she wants to die so badly. I wanted her to succeed. And uh, she never did succeed. I just eventually uh, accepted that she was just really, truly awful at suicide. <laughs> um, moving to another topic. Let's talk about seasonal depression. I have recently, I was having a conversation with a girlfriend of mine and, and uh, she said that I suffer from seasonal depression and I, I was so shocked. I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, you know, when you used to be married, your, your wife and I, uh, when winter would roll around, your mood would change and we'd look at each other and we'd go, here it comes. And I, I never really was aware of that, but people around me apparently feel that I suffer from seasonal depression. 
Um, how do you feel about the seasons? Does that, does that affect you? I think it's hard not to be affected by the seasons. Like it's dark most of the time at this time of year. It's cold and when the sun is up it's often grey and wet outside. Uh, and if you feel the same at the same time each year then I would say that you're definitely experiencing seasonal affective disorder or SAD, sad <laughs> as it's called. Uh, the best remedies for it I think are to spend time with others, to watch comedies, to go out to stuff. Uh, my personal favourite thing to do is to take a trip somewhere that is made more beautiful by the winter, like to the mountains or somewhere. Riri, it, it just occurred to me that when we filmed in Australia for Gothic Homemaking, it was your winter, but it felt like an American summer to me. Uh, and in fact, I think I remember some of my Australian friends complaining that you guys don't have seasons at all. <laughs> so maybe, maybe you're not prone to seasonal depression, but uh, how about the holidays? Do they, uh, does this time of year, does the holiday season impact you negatively? I, I think with the events that's just happened in my life um, in the last couple of months, I think the season is really playing on it. You came to my show in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, anybody who's been to one of my shows in the last couple of years, you've heard me tell a story about my childhood, about how I was relentlessly bullied, about how I was molested, about how my childhood sweetheart killed herself when I was 16 years old, and how ultimately I made the choice at 17 to end my life as well. And I joke in the show about how I, you know, I didn't kill myself, obviously, and I joke in the show about how my suicide plans were never canceled, they were just placed on hold. <laughs> and, um, it's not really a joke, of course. The truth is that I have dealt with suicidal ideation my entire life. Uh, and I hope it's not too personal a question to ask, but is it something that you think about? Is suicide something that, uh, that you consider? Please continue to put those plans on hold. Um, the world is a much more wonderful place with you in it, if I may say so. Um, but I can imagine it's a terrible thing to live with. I, I don't want to imagine. Um, fortunately, I've never wanted to kill myself. Um, the lowest I've ever felt was thinking, well, like, if I found out I was going to die, I guess I wouldn't really care that much. Um, but that was just sort of brief. Um, no, I'm just, I'm just angry with all the people I know who have done that. Uh, I just deal with the never-ending grief of friends and loved ones who have done it. And uh, that's, a, that's a shitty feeling. I do remember you talking, not only in your show, but to me um, privately about um, your suicide plans and it really rang home, like a, a home truth with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I do tend to be a little flippant about the tentative nature of the remainder of my time here on uh, planet Earth. Um, but we'll get back to why that is. Uh, now though, what I'm really curious about is why the story I shared with you hit so close to home. It just feels like the last few months has just been spiraling and, um, you know, going to be bluntly, absolutely bluntly honest. Um, last week, 11 days ago, um, I tried to take my own life. And I think that's the lowest I've been for quite some time. And the only reason I'm saying this is not for sympathy, but it's the fact that um, I had wonderful, absolutely fucking wonderful people. Um, um, I had wonderful people who I've actually opened up to see that I was in a horrible state and they, they helped me. They helped me to reverse my decision and got me, they've got me into help and all of that stuff. So I'm very grateful for my friends. I'm very grateful for my family because if it wasn't for the fact that they saw that I was just not me, um, even, you know, my low moods, I was 
below the ground. Um, if they didn't see that, or if the fact that I didn't open up to them about the struggles um, that have been going on within my head, then I probably wouldn't be here. I am so sorry to hear that you had to go through that. Uh, but I'm glad you're still here. And I, and I say that, I say that selfishly. Because I love you. And I love Black Friday and the friendship that we have brings so much joy to my life and, and it enriches my life so much. And I, I want for you, both of you knuckleheads, to be stuck on this planet for as long as I'm stuck on this planet. <laughs> but maybe that's selfish for me to say, you know, because when somebody wants to die, you know, they want for all of their troubles to be over. And I just want you to stay here. But the nature of, of suicide is, it's selfish in that, uh, in that way, you know, that somebody has kind of had enough of life and they, and they want to uh, end it. But uh, it's the ones who are left behind who, like Friday said, who are, who are left to mourn and to grieve and to, and to live in anguish for years to come. It's ultimately a pretty terrible thing to do to your loved ones. Actually, I think I have to um, take back what I said about it being selfish because if, if uh, suicidal ideation is a, is a mental illness, then, you know, it's more than likely you don't really have uh, a lot of control over it and uh, you can't really be selfish if you uh, can't control your own thoughts, really. The story that I told Riri in Brisbane, Australia last summer was that and maybe this is a, I don't know, proof of seasonal depression for me, I don't know. But this time last year, I was very, very consciously plotting my own death. And uh, there were reasons for why, I, I think, why I was feeling so down. Um, but I had kind of told myself that I should just go to a jungle because there were so many dying opportunities in a jungle. I thought, you probably have to like try actually really hard to stay alive in a jungle. So I booked myself a flight to Costa Rica by myself, and I was there for a week. And then the great irony of it is that by no plan of my own whatsoever, I had three near-death experiences in one day. I literally almost died three times within an hour of each other in one day, and uh, it snapped me out of it for a little bit. It really did. Uh, but I gotta say, it wasn't that it made me not want to die. It just, I just suddenly realized how I didn't want to die. Like I knew I didn't want to fall from a cliff and break my spine on a rock. I know that now. Um, there was a tour that I went on just before that, um, the Gothic tour. Uh, it was a cruise, the Gothic cruise, I should say where I was performing on a cruise from Seattle to Alaska, and I spent a week researching uh, how to kill yourself on a cruise ship, you know, how to jump off of a cruise ship to ensure your death, and I didn't do it, obviously, and I, I'm going to tell you what stopped me, but first, I want to know, Riri, what is it when you're, when you're in your darkest moments and you're having suicidal thought, thoughts, what is it that stays your hand? What is it that keeps you alive? What keeps me alive? You know, I know a lot of people would be expecting me to say my, my daughter, but I've always had this thought in my head that she would do so much better if I just didn't exist. Because I feel like all I do is drag her down. And, you know, I, I feel like this with all the people in my life. With my recent suicide attempt, the only reason I'm still on this planet is the fact that my friends knew exactly what I was doing. And, you know, it, it was, they knew where I am mentally because of everything that's been going on in the last couple of months and how it's just absolutely destroying my head. But, all I had to text them was, I love you. And yeah, if it wasn't for them, yeah. 
And the only reason I say that my friends are the ones that kept me alive was just because I felt in this moment where I felt like I was completely unlovable. Um, I felt like someone actually cared about me. Do, do we do we even need to finish? Do we need to finish shooting this episode? Can we just maybe Friday and I get on a plane and just go to Australia and hug you and maybe we could just glue some macaroni to a piece of cardboard in the shape of a bat and paint it black and call it gothic homemaking. I mean, isn't Christ, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing on this show? Uh, um, what about you, Friday? What about you? Is, any, any, any chances that you're thinking about shuffling off this mortal coil? I would never do it. Uh, because no matter how bad things are, there is always hope. There is. And regardless of how dark and impossible it seems, there is hope. And if you end your life, you are removing all hope and any chance for improvement. But there is an eternity to be dead and only a brief spark in which to live a life. Um, and life can be anything. Uh, like, it's a big and amazing world that we live in. There are always ways to change your situation. You can start a whole new life. So I would never do it because then there's still hope. I'm really, really happy to hear that Friday. I certainly don't want you to die. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you wouldn't do it, but I totally would. <laughs> I totally would. Uh, maybe i don't know i mean you know i didn't jump off that cruise ship right so why i have a very good reason i told you i would tell you and here's the answer propeller blades propeller blades are hurdy they're hurdy i am not afraid of death i have lived such a long and and wonderful life if i died this very moment i'd have no regrets but i'm afraid of pain because i'm a coward i'm a coward that is the part that scares me. Maybe having seen my mother not succeed so many times has terrified me, but that's the part that frightens me. You know, I, I, I met a girl recently and I liked her and she didn't like me back and I thought I should drink a gallon of bleach. This is a true story. And I looked up what happens when you drink a gallon of bleach. Spoiler alert, don't do it. It's awful, it's terrible. You're lucky if you die, you probably won't. It's an awful, awful thing to do. Uh, so, so I'm a coward. I think that's the number one reason why, why I'm still alive today. But if you have seen my shows, you know that there is another reason that I'm alive today, despite having decided to kill myself when I was 17. And that is that I accepted death at 17. And from that point on, nothing can really hurt you once you accept death. So that day when I was about to kill myself, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna do whatever I wanna do today because at the end of the day, I'm gonna be dead anyway. I stood up for myself. I advocated for myself. When the bullies approached me at school, I told them exactly what I thought of them and they walked away. When a teacher made fun of me in a class, I stood up and I told her she was an embarrassment to the profession of teaching. And she sat down and left me alone. And when I went home that day and my parents made fun of me because of the way I dressed, I told them exactly what I thought of them. I told them how incredibly superficial it was for them to have a problem with the way I was dressed. I got good grades at school. I wasn't a drug addict. I, I never got arrested. I never caused trouble. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. And, and, and I told them that they shouldn't bully a good person. And ultimately that's why I'm alive today. It's because I treat every single day like it's my last and I stand up for myself and I refuse to be bullied. And I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky because like yourselves, I have lots of fans that send me letters of support every single day. Um, and that, that believe it or not, that really kind of gets you through sometimes. Is, is that how is that how you guys feel? Do you f find strength and support through your fan base and the letters they send you? I I really do. Um, I feel bad sometimes that I can't answer every email, every message, everything that I get from people. I try to read as many as I can. Uh, absolutely, I love reading them. You know, ninety nine percent of them are just support and love and uh, 
I, I absolutely adore it. But the, the bulk of it can get kind of daunting sometimes, no? Um, you know, having having that many people who, who write to you and, and are expecting like sort of a speedy reply, do you, do you ever feel that way? Yeah, I understand that. Um, my inboxes overflow with messages and reminders of all the things I haven't done yet and all the people I haven't replied to. And I'm sure those people think I am too arrogant to reply to them or too hopeless to do what they ask me to. Um, I only recently realized that it's okay not to answer everything and not to do everything, just to do as much as you can at a time and learning not to feel guilty about that. Um, but I do draw a lot of strength from the support that my fans send me. Um, it, it makes my heart swell to read their messages and makes me feel like I'm not alone. Oh my god, yes. That's actually, that I believe was the number one source of my depression this time last year is I, I just felt trapped. I, I felt like I was spending all of my time answering messages on Instagram and Facebook and and YouTube and, and via email. You know, you know, I feel like for, for a long time in my career, one of the things that sets me apart from other musicians is that I'm accessible. And I think like over the years, I've come to believe that the reason people like me as an artist is because I'm accessible. And, and I think I, I got to feeling like I was drowning because I was spending all of my time answering messages and not enough of my time making the art people allegedly are supposed to love. And I had to learn, like you did, to step away from it and say, it's okay not to answer it all. It breaks my heart not to answer it. I feel like a terrible human being. But I also had to learn to give myself a little bit of credit, you know, because I thought like, oh, if I stop answering these emails, people will stop liking me as an artist because this is what they like about me that they can reach me you know you can't really email Marilyn Manson but you can email me and get a reply presumably and I had to I had to learn not only to step away from it but to give myself some credit you know like when you go to see a Tim Burton movie you don't get to have a conversation with Tim Burton about the movie afterwards but I, I felt like I felt like if I wasn't there to have a conversation with people about my music after they listened to it that uh, maybe they would not be interested anymore. Um, but speaking of fans, you know, another phenomenon uh, is that I get a lot of emails from fans asking for advice and sometimes it's, you know, my, my girlfriend left me and I'm really upset or, uh, you know, I'm very depressed or also, you know, people who are having suicidal thoughts and uh, it's uh, I'm sure you probably do as well how, how do you how do you handle these emails from uh, people who are look up to you and want advice from you I do get messages a lot about people in their depression and um, I do try to you know message them back when I see them um, or, you know, a couple of times I've had a, a Skype conversation, actually. I had two Skype conversations with people who were feeling very, very suicidal. And, you know, just just trying to just not talk about their issues, just be there and, you know, show that someone, some bloody stranger that they look at pictures online, um, you know, actually wants them to not do something to themselves. I, I honestly think that's really, really noble of you. I really do. Uh, Friday, how about you? Uh, how do you deal with this? Do you get these kinds of messages as well? Yeah, quite often. I wish I could help every person who sends me letters like that. Um, and I do feel honored that they feel like they can ask me for help. But I would, I would encourage those people to perhaps visit a local counselling service rather than someone online who might not see the message in time or at all. Like, uh, I found some scary letters that had been sent like to me months before and like, of course I freaked out. I do feel somewhat burdened sometimes when I have a sudden influx, um, like especially at this time of year, actually I've noticed a lot of people messaging me saying I'm feeling very suicidal and can we please talk and you know that stuff. Um, I do feel bad especially because I'm going through my own crap at the moment. Um, you know this is more than I've ever had to handle in my life before. 
I, I have to admit, it really freaks me out a bit. Um, I really, I feel for people and I really, really want to help them, but I find it very distressing because of the bulk of email that I get. I may not see it, I may not get to it. Um, and you know, people thinking that you're ignoring them might, might contribute to their depression and might lead them to hurt themselves. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not trained in any of these issues. So there's another another aspect of it that I find very unnerving is that if I do answer, I might say something, I might say the wrong thing, it might be interpreted poorly and it and it could lead someone to doing something harmful to themselves. So, you know, while I really, really want to help people, I, I find it very, very, you know, it gives me quite a lot of anxiety, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? I wish I could help them, but I can't help them when I'm in a place of needing help as well. The drowned can't help the drowning, so um, I think, you know, people need to be a little bit more aware of that. What is your advice for our viewers who may be feeling depressed or even contemplating suicide? Well, obviously, don't do it. But the piece of advice that I wish I listened to but didn't for a really long time is be true to yourself, be honest with those you care about and those around you, and learn what your boundaries are. Because I often find that the most depressed people that I know are the people who are, you know, covering up their own sadness in order to make someone else happy. I would say just keep going. That's how I get through the most heinous anxiety and crushing dark fog. Like just keep going. And don't let that shit control you. It's remember it's not you, it's just something that's in your head. And though it might weigh you down like a boulder tied to your ankle, just keep moving forward. Sometimes it's okay to be selfish. Think about yourself and your own mental state. You can't do anything until you are 100% or at least close to 100%. So be a little bit selfish. Help yourself before you help others and stop pretending. Find people to talk to, to spend time with, and don't be afraid to tell someone what you're experiencing. Um, and if you really decide that you're going to do it, tell someone right away. One step in front of the other, one breath after another, just keep going, persevere, it will get better. That is all really, really great advice. I also want to add that uh, as comforting as it may seem to reach out to someone that you admire online about your problems, what you really need in the case of depression and suicide is a friend, somebody who knows you well, somebody who is preferably near you, who can talk to you and hold you and help you pass the time until you get a handle on what it is that you're feeling. And if you don't have a friend like that, I implore you, please do a search for suicide helpline on your phone or online. I don't know where you are, but almost everywhere you can find somebody who will talk to you 24 hours a day on the phone like a friend they will listen to you and they won't judge you and they will help you and speaking of friends i just want to say i am so honored to have spent time today with two of my favorite people in the entire world thank you so much for joining me for sharing your thoughts and your honesty and for enriching my life with your friendship thank you so much for being here black friday well, thank you so much for inviting me along. If it's been helpful to even one person, then it was worth doing. And thank you, Riri, for being here as well. I really appreciate you both so much. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate being able to open up about this. Um, and yeah, bye. And thank you for watching. I want to leave you with this one last thought. When I was 17 years old and I decided to end my life, I honestly thought my life would never get better. If you had told me then that I'd become a stop motion animator just one year later and work in television, I would not have believed you. If you had told me that I would become a musician and I would tour the world playing my music for people, I would not have believed you. If you had told me that I would make a human being all by myself, I'm kidding, his mom helped, and that he would turn out to be an amazing guy, 
I would not have believed you. But all of these dreams came true. These days, in my darkest times, I think about that. I think about how if I had died when I was 17, none of this would have happened. And I think about what incredible fairy tale adventure awaits around the next corner. And I know that I will only be able to see it if I stay alive to see it. And that's what I think about when times are the darkest. And I hope you will think about that too. There's a great adventure waiting for you. You need to stick around for it. Thank you so much for watching. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much for watching Gothic Homemaking Presents. You can watch full episodes of Gothic Homemaking right here on this same YouTube playlist. If you enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe to the channel so that you won't miss our next one. Thanks again.